The secret to a good mix is probably much simpler than you think. In this video, Dan Worrell will go through the four essential elements that every great mix has in common. If you like Audio University's videos, you'll definitely want to check out Dan's channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. Hi, and first of all, big thanks to Kyle for inviting me to guest on his channel. My name is Dan, and you might recognize my voice from official product demos and tutorials that I've made for various different plugin developers over the years. I also have my own channel where I review plugins and talk about whatever interests me, which tends to be advanced tweaky techniques like parallel filtering or mid-side processing tricks. And I'm here to tell you now that most of them won't help you get a good mix. I guess I should explain that. I'm going to use a question I got from a viewer as a way into the topic. The question was about how buses differ on hardware consoles compared to a DAW. I answered accordingly, then got a follow-up question. Yes, but how many buses do you get? Turns out they were worried that their mixes sound bad because they're using too many. They have a template full of YouTuber tricks and techniques and were afraid that this was degrading the sound. I haven't heard any of their mixes, but I can guarantee the issue is not too many buses. In reality, if a mix sounds bad, it's always because the basics are not right. Those tweaky YouTuber tricks and techniques won't help you get a good mix together, and I'm including my own. They might, when used appropriately, help to elevate a good mix to a great mix. But the good mix is a prerequisite, and you get to that by fixing the fundamentals. Balance, EQ, dynamics, ambience. Better. Get the basics right for a better mix. Too cheesy? Let's have a little chat about each of those. Now, back in my live sound days, there was a perennial question asked of me by punters when I was running front of house, especially back when we were using huge analog consoles with real pots instead of touchscreens. Do you actually know what all those knobs and buttons do? The question came up so often it was kind of a joke among front of house engineers, and my answer would vary depending on how stressed and harassed I was feeling. After a difficult sound check, they might get a curt, yes, that's my job. If I was feeling more relaxed, it might be, haven't a clue mate, but got away with it so far. Joking aside, however, there was one set of controls that I think most people understood. The faders are the volume controls, right? Push up the fader with a guitar scribbled underneath and the guitar will get louder. This seems so obvious and intuitive that for most people it doesn't need explaining. It wasn't always so. The first consoles used rotary pots or switches to control volume. Someone had to actually invent the linear fader as we know it today, and that someone was Tom Dowd. But his implementation wasn't quite as we know it. It was inverted. Pushing the fader up, as we would call it today, would make the signal quieter, not louder. That might seem weird and counterintuitive to us, but it's not as mad as it initially seems. Consider the precedent first. Organs traditionally use draw bars to control the levels of different partials, and you pull these out towards you to make them louder, or push them back in to make them quieter. The configuration has a particular advantage in a broadcast context, as you're guaranteed never to accidentally open up a channel by leaning your elbow on the console. But the main reason Tom Dowd configured it this way around, and the reason I'm mentioning it now, is because he felt that was the more intuitive arrangement. Pulling the fader towards you makes the part louder, which pulls that part towards you in the mix. And conversely, pushing the fader away from you pushes that part further into the background. Of course, it wasn't that much further back in time when recordings would be made using a single microphone or single horn, and the balance between parts would be determined by physically moving the musicians forward or backwards to change their relative distance from the transducer. So perhaps it felt more natural to mimic this relationship with the fader travel back in those days. And perhaps we need to be reminded of this relationship. The faders determine the front-to-back depths of your mix and are the single most important factor. If you don't have a good balance, you don't have a good mix. So what do I mean by a good balance? First of all, I definitely don't mean getting all the meters to read the same level. Your DAW meters probably show peak levels. Those are important when you're tracking to show you how close you are to clipping. 
but pretty much irrelevant otherwise. They tell you almost nothing about how loud your parts sound. If you match peak levels for every channel, your drums will be inaudible, and the distorted guitar will totally obliterate everything else. OK, then you might respond. I saw a video about gain staging using VU meters, so I'll just use those instead, right? Wrong. First of all, there's nothing magic about VU meters. Yes, they average out signal levels to some degree, and they represent loudness a bit better than peak meters, but they still kind of suck and won't help you with your balance. So, RMS metering then, is that the answer? Well, it's an improvement, in the sense that RMS levels do track perceived loudness quite well. If you set every channel to have the same RMS levels, they should be reasonably well matched in terms of loudness and sound roughly the same volume. And yes, likewise if you used a modern loudness meter and measured LUFS instead of RMS. But this is not what I mean by a good balance, at least not necessarily. Perhaps sometimes you'll need every element of a mix to be equally present and significant, but usually you don't. Let's remember that most people are not musicians, and certainly not audio engineers. Even if you're early in your producing and engineering journey, your ears will likely be much better trained and refined than the average pop music fan, who I believe perceives music as singing with some exciting stuff behind it. Perhaps in your case the focal point is not a vocal, but some other part instead. That's fine, but that part should probably be mixed firmly up front and prominent just as they would probably be up front and centre stage for the live show. Give your listeners clear signposts as to what they should be focusing on by controlling the front-to-back depth of your mix with the faders. It's important to note that, as simple as it seems, setting a good balance is a skill that needs to be learned and will improve with practice. Typical beginner mistakes include vocal too quiet. Remember that it's easier to reduce the front-to-back depth of a mix with compression than to do the opposite, so probably better to err on the side of too much lead vocal than the other way around. Drums too quiet. I wonder if people are misled by the peak meters into thinking the drums are too loud and turn them down despite what they're hearing. Get those beats nice and loud and make your listeners want to shake their booties. And finally, bass part too loud. Yes, I know, you want to hear a really solid deep bass. But you don't achieve that by cranking the bass part up loud, rather by making sure that nothing is competing with it in those solid deep bass frequency ranges. And that brings me to the second basic building block of a good mix, EQ. Yes, EQ can be used to mitigate or correct mistakes made when recording. That's perfectly valid. EQ can also be used creatively to shape the tone of a part to your liking without regard to what is correct also perfectly valid. But there's a much more fundamental and vital application when it comes to mixing, which we can think of as simply an extension of the first fundamental. EQ lets us control the balance of each different frequency band of the mix independently. We can ensure that, around 50 or 60 hertz, the balance is dominated by the kick drum, with the low fundamental of the bass guitar sitting behind it. But we can reverse that up at 100 hertz and sit the bass in front of the kick for that frequency range. And in doing so, we can stop those parts interfering with one another and keep them both clearly audible at the same time. There are two important points to grasp to understand why we need to do this. First of all, all the different elements we're mixing together end up as one stereo waveform. All the separation between parts is an illusion created inside the listener's head. And second, if there's something loud happening at a specific frequency, you won't be able to hear quieter elements at or near that frequency. This is known as frequency masking. So as mix engineers, we need to make it easy for the listener to decode the waveform and separate it into its component parts. If the most important frequencies of each instrument are mixed in front of the other elements, while the less important frequencies are tucked behind, the mix will have clarity and separation. It will be easy to distinguish each different part. It'll be a pleasure to listen to.
But if the important frequencies of some or all the parts are masked by the less important frequencies of other parts, your mix will be cluttered and confused. Your listener will strain to try to separate the parts and make sense of what they're hearing and might not succeed at all. I like to think of it as weaving parts together. For a part to be clearly audible, it needs to poke through the mix in at least one place. If your bass guitar part, for example, is the loudest element at, say, 100 Hz, you'll be able to hear it clearly and it will provide a solid, low fundamental for the mix. If that's the only place it pokes through the mix, however, it will seem very warm and soft, because all the aggressive frequencies are higher than that. And if you want a part to seem big, it will probably need to poke through the mix in more than one place. For an aggressive, flea-style slap bass part, you'll probably need to make sure that the bass weaves back to the front of the mix around the 2K or 2K5 region. For the kick drum, you might want this to dominate down at 50 Hz, but then thread it behind the other elements for most of the mid-range and bring it back to the front for the clicky region around 4 or 5K. If our brain hears the deep 50 Hz thump clearly and the aggressive 5K click clearly, it will link those two and perceive it as a huge, powerful kick occupying all the region in between. Important to note that while I'm saying those two frequencies are the important ones for the kick, that doesn't mean you should totally remove everything else. Doing that is likely to break the illusion and just sound weird. Rather, use the EQ to gently push those less important frequencies behind the other elements, but allow the listener to still get little glimpses of that thread in the background so they understand that it's all one big kick drum. And a quick disclaimer, the numbers I quote here are just examples. While they are fairly typical, the important frequencies might be different for your mix. I'm definitely not saying that 50 Hz and 5 kHz will always be the most important kick frequencies. Final point about EQ again, it takes practice. More specifically, you need to train your ears to recognise different frequencies. I've talked about that recently on my own channel, however, so I won't repeat myself. Instead, let's move on to dynamics. I want to split them into two separate concepts, macrodynamics and microdynamics. Macrodynamics are what classical musicians mean when they use the term dynamics, the difference between loud and quiet. A very dynamic piece would be something that has very quiet pianissimo sections and also very loud fortissimo sections. In a mix context, the main way we manipulate macrodynamics is through volume automation. And there are two main reasons to do this. First of all, you might just need to correct excessive dynamics in the performance, especially something like a vocal part. But second, we can change the balance for different parts of the mix for creative reasons. We can think of this as simply an extension of the first principle once again. Rather than setting one static balance for the whole song, we can optimise the balance for each section. Rather than just signposting what's important, you can give your listeners a guided tour. Perhaps a part needs to be a little louder the first time it comes in to grab the listener's attention and establish itself clearly, but can then sit back a little later on in the song when some other part needs to be the focus. Of course, a good arrangement will address most of those issues in other ways. For example, the first time that part comes in, you can simply ensure there's nothing else going on that competes. But some sympathetic volume automation can greatly enhance a good arrangement and can make a song much more engaging and easy to listen to, especially for the first time. All right, so what about microdynamics? This is what mix or mastering engineers might be referring to when discussing dynamics, depending on the context. If a mastering engineer refers to a mix as very dynamic, they might mean it has a high peak to average ratio, that the transients are very prominent. Acoustic drums naturally have a very high peak to average ratio, so a natural and minimally processed recording of a drum kit will tend to be very dynamic in microdynamic terms. But if the drummer pounds away with the same energy for the whole song, 
that recording could, simultaneously, have very little in the way of macrodynamics. Anyway, the main tool we use to control microdynamics is compression, and this is hugely important to modern pop and rock music. Obviously, distortion, and distorted guitar amps in particular, had a huge impact on modern music, and our musical landscape would be radically different without it. I would say that compression, and compressed drums in particular, have had an equally large impact. But unlike distortion, which is pretty easy to hear, compression is subliminal. Most people don't notice it consciously. And this is probably part of the reason it's so effective. Your listener doesn't know why, they just know those drums sound like they're exploding from the speakers, and they like it. So learning to use compression is another huge part of learning to mix modern music styles, and learning to hear compression consciously is a big part of that. But there's a recent video on my own channel in which I talk about ear training strategies, both for EQ and compression, and there's a load of resources on this channel and my own covering specific compression techniques. I'm trying to keep this video more conceptual and philosophical, so I'll leave compression there and move on to my final fundamental ambience, by which I mean all types of reverb and delay effects, but especially the subliminal ones that you don't notice unless they're missing. This is the first of my basic principles that isn't just really some extension of balance. And it's also going to require the biggest insight into the workings of our own brains. Imagine this scenario. You make a video recording of a musical performance. It turns out well, except the sound from the camera mic is much too roomy and ambient. Of course it is, right? For professional results, you're going to need a separate multi-track recording and mix down, which could then replace the camera audio in post. But why is that? The camera mic was right near your head while you were recording. It didn't sound too roomy to you at the time. It sounded great. Why is the microphone picking up so much of the room when your ears didn't? The answer is kind of shocking and surprising. Your ears do pick up all that excess roominess, just like the microphone did. But your brain filters it out before you get to actually hear it. As soon as you enter a room, your brain starts to pick up subtle acoustic clues and figures out what that room's reverb characteristics are. And it then subtracts those reverb characteristics from whatever your ears pick up, so you can, as far as possible, hear the sound as it really is. The process is kind of similar to the way we see colour. We don't just perceive the raw data from our eyes. Our brain first makes a judgement about the ambient light, then corrects for it, and only then decides what colour it's going to show you. That's why, under the right circumstances, some people can see a dress as blue and black when it's actually gold and white. Or was it the other way around? Anyway, this cuts right to the heart of why we need recording engineers and studios at all. We're not trying to accurately capture the sound in the room. Your camera mic probably did that quite well, in fact. We're trying to trick the listener into hearing the sound as they would have if they were in the room. There are basically two different ways to deal with the issue. First of all, we can record in glorious sounding rooms. And that doesn't necessarily mean long and lush sounding reverb tales, because in fact, the smaller the room, the less the effect of the acoustics is reverb as we would normally think of it, and the more it becomes a type of EQ. I'm planning at some point a video for my own channel called What's the Difference Between Reverb and EQ? And the answer to that question isn't as simple as you might expect. Meanwhile though, consider the acoustics of an old school telephone booth. 
you're probably imagining boxy resonances rather than any obvious reverb tail. Now consider the body of an acoustic guitar. It's a trapped volume of air, just like a room, only smaller. But its effect on the sound of the guitar is much more like that of an EQ than that of a reverb. So a great sounding room could mean one that doesn't skew the frequency response too much, but keeps the sound relatively flat or shapes it in gently flattering ways. This approach is problematic in a couple of different ways. Few of us have easy access to glorious sounding rooms for a start. I'm guessing the majority of you are working in some kind of home or project studio. And even fewer of us have access to a range of different glorious sounding rooms because the acoustics that are flattering for a grand piano might not be so ideal for rock drums. The other problem with this approach is recording the right amount of room. The most obvious way to control the ratio between direct and reflected sound is to move the microphone closer to or further from the source. But it can be very difficult to gauge this correctly on the day, especially if you're tracking up parts one by one and you don't have the full context yet. So the obvious solution there is to use multiple microphones. Place one close to the source to pick up predominantly direct sound, then place ambient microphones to pick up predominantly reflected sound and blend them to taste later. Those of us that lack access to glorious rooms are forced to take a different approach. We use a close mic again to pick up mostly direct signal, and then we use some kind of artificial reverb instead of the ambient mics. This is a very powerful and flexible approach, but in what is becoming a theme in this video, it also requires some ear training. You need to become more consciously aware of reverb, especially the very short, small room kind, so that you can recognize when you need to add more of it to your mix. It's a strange contradiction that while having reverb burnt into a recording kind of breaks the brain's ability to remove that reverb, as it would if you were in the room, having no reflections at all in a recording usually doesn't sound good either. With none of the usual spatial cues, the sound seems to float in a void. It seems small and lost. In modern pop music, the lead vocal is often presented very dry and upfront, with no obvious reverb. But it's never actually dry. A completely dry vocal will sound like it's stuck on top and disconnected from the rest of the mix. In fact, there will be just enough early reflections to satisfy your brain that Yes, indeed, that vocal is right up in your face. And like everything else, it takes practice and ear training before you can nail that every time. Now, of course, there are other considerations when mixing, as well as those four fundamentals I listed. If I were to add a fifth, it would probably be saturation and distortion. But while it is certainly possible for a mix to be too clean, if that's the only problem with the mix, it's probably already a good mix.
just maybe not great yet. But that's okay. A good mix is already a great achievement and a great foundation on which to build a great mix. This is the stage at which the tweaky YouTuber tricks might start to make a positive difference. And my final tip, get to that stage as fast as you can. Take care of the basics first thing in your mix. Work quickly and don't overthink your moves. They're all provisional anyway at that stage because you don't have the context of a good mix in which to judge them. Once you have a good mix and the basics are in place, you can then make good judgments about the subtle tweaks and embellishments that might take it up another level. Getting to that stage quickly is not only more fun, but will also invariably result in a better mix. Okay, that's all. Thanks for watching. And thanks again to Kyle for having me.